I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament. Direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I invite, I invite members and senators to take their seats. And on behalf of the House, I welcome as guests the President of the Senate, the Honourable Senators to this sitting of the House of Representatives, to hear an address by His Excellency Mr. Shinzo Abe, Prime Minister of Japan. Honourable members, honourable senators, the Prime Minister of Japan.
Mr. Prime Minister, I welcome you to the House of Representatives Chamber. Your address today is, is a significant occasion in the history of this House. I now call on the Honourable the Prime Minister to welcome Prime Minister Abe. Madam Speaker, Mr President, on this historic occasion today, we welcome to this parliament a great friend of Australia, the Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. Leaders from the United States, China, the United Kingdom, Canada, Indonesia and New Zealand have addressed both houses of this Australian parliament. So it is fitting that we should now hear from the Prime Minister of Japan in recognition of our special <laughs> relationship, built on shared interests and common values, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, more open markets and freer trade. Madam Speaker, during one of our parliament's early debates, Prime Minister Deakin noted the high ability, inexhaustible energy and endurance of the Japanese people that he said, made them such competitors. At some times it's true, Australians have not felt as kindly towards Japan as we now do, but we have never, ever underestimated the quality and the capacity of the Japanese people. Even at the height of World War II, Australia gave the Japanese submariners killed in the attack on Sydney full military honours. Admiral Muirhead Gould said of them, theirs was a courage which is not the property or the tradition or the heritage of any one nation, but was patriotism of a very high order. We admired the skill and the sense of honour that they brought to their task, although we disagreed with what they did. Perhaps we grasped even then that with a change of heart, the fiercest of opponents could be the best of friends. Because just 12 years after World War II, Japan, Japan's Prime Minister Kishi, Prime Minister Abe's grandfather, visited Australia and paid his respects to Australia's war dead at the War Memorial in Canberra, as you, Prime Minister, have done yourself today. Prime Minister Kishi also signed the Commerce Treaty between Australia and Japan, which helped to spawn the iron ore and coal industries that have done so much for both our countries. Prime Ministers Menzies and Kishi allowed history to be their teacher, not their master, and in so doing provided a lesson in magnanimity for all times and for all peoples. Madam Speaker, since 1957, Australian coal, iron ore and gas has powered Japan's prosperity, and Japanese cars, consumer goods and electronics have transformed Australians' lives. Australians are grateful. Australians are grateful for the Japanese trade and the Japanese investment that has helped to build our modern prosperity. Above all, we appreciate the mutual respect and trust that has underpinned the commercial relationship. Later today, Prime Minister Abe and I will sign the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement, a new and perhaps equally historic agreement to further liberalise trade between our countries. This is the first free trade agreement that Japan has made with a major developed economy. For Japan, it means even better access for its manufactured goods. For Australia, it means better access for our beef, dairy, wine, horticulture and grain products. For everyone everywhere, it means that two significant countries are prepared to put their hopes above their fears and declare their confidence in the future. Freer trade means more efficiency. More efficiency means more wealth, 
and more wealth means more jobs. This is the message that both Japan and Australia will bring to the G20's leaders' meeting in Brisbane in November. Freer trade means more economic growth, and more economic growth means more prosperous people and fairer societies. Both Australia and Japan are serious about boosting economic growth. Australia, through lower taxes, less regulation and through shifting spending from short-term consumption to long-term investment. Japan, with the third arrow of Arbanomics, through less regulated health care, greater female participation, openness to foreign investment and better corporate governance. Madam Speaker, because it takes rare courage to challenge entrenched ideas, even ideas that are holding your country back, Prime Minister Abe is making his mark on history. Also on this visit, our two countries will conclude an agreement on the transfer of defence equipment and technology, similar to the agreements that Japan already has with the United States and the United Kingdom. For decades now, Japan has been an exemplary international citizen. So Australia welcomes Japan's recent decision to be a more capable strategic partner in our region. I stress, ours is not a partnership against anyone. It's a partnership for peace, for prosperity and for the rule of law. Our objective is engagement. And we both welcome the greater trust and openness in our region that's exemplified by China's participation in this year's RIMPAC naval exercises. Madam Speaker, Australia and Japan are approaching the 100th anniversary of the first significant occasion when our countries worked together. The Japanese cruiser Ibuki helped to escort the 1914 Anzac convoy to the Middle East, and I am grateful that a Japanese warship will be present for the centenary event in Albany later this year. More recently, Australian soldiers worked together with Japanese engineers to help rebuild war-torn Iraq. And I'm pleased to say, Madam Speaker, that the Australian commander in that mission, former Brigadier Andrew Nikolic, is now the member for Bass in this parliament. Yeah. Madam Speaker, under Prime Minister Gillard, Australia was one of the first countries to dispatch assistance to Japan after the devastating 2011 earthquake and tsunami. This, Madam Speaker, is the Australian way. We are true to our word. We threaten no one. We are an utterly reliable partner, and we go out of our way to help when trouble strikes. We helped Indonesia after the Indian Ocean tsunami, the Philippines after Typhoon Haiyan, and the search for flight MH370, which saw Japanese, Korean and Chinese aviators operating together from an Australian base to try to solve the greatest mystery of our time. Madam Speaker, it was Prime Minister Chifley who spoke of a light on the hill to work for the betterment of mankind, not just here but wherever we can lend a helping hand. Australia is at the service of the wider world as an affordable energy superpower, as a plentiful supplier of good food and as a safe place to get the best and most affordable education. We hope that all the countries of our region will look to us to provide the energy security, the resources security and the food security that all seek. Over the past two generations, Australian resources have helped to drive the economic miracles of Japan, of Korea and, most spectacularly of all, of China. What's happened in Asia over the past 50 years is a transformation unparalleled in human history. Hundreds of millions of people have been lifted from poverty into the middle class. It is the greatest and swiftest advance in human welfare of all time. Great credit belongs to the people and the governments of Asia, 
but Australia is proud to have played our part. We should also be grateful to the United States for its work to guarantee the peace and stability that has made this progress possible. Now, Madam Speaker, the rest of the world has watched these marvels with awe and admiration. It's the reason these times have already been dubbed the Asian century. But we can't take a better future for granted. For all the opportunities we have, success still has to be earned. It would be a tragedy for everyone and a disaster for us were these achievements to be put at risk. And history teaches us that issues between nations should be resolved peacefully in accordance with international law, because the alternative is in no one's best long-term interests. The lesson of the last century is that the countries of our region will all advance together, or none of us will advance at all. Prime Minister Howard frequently said that Australia did not have to choose between our history and our geography. My version of this has been to say that you don't win new friends by losing old ones. This government is determined to improve all Australia's friendships by focusing on the things we have in common. Australia and Japan have forged one of the world's firmest friendships and most practical of partnerships, but it wasn't always thus. Our partnership began from the ashes of the most destructive war in history because our peoples and our leaders have consistently refused to let the past blight the future. Every country's situation is different, of course, but what a compelling example our two nations have provided of what is possible when we are all our best selves. Madam Speaker, we are honoured to have Prime Minister Abe in our parliament today, thrilled and honoured, and we all look forward to his address. Yeah. I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition to support the remarks of the Prime Minister. Yeah. Madam Speaker, <coughs> On this historic day, let me first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the first lawgivers of our nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Prime Minister Abe, on behalf of the opposition, it is my great privilege to join with the Prime Minister in welcoming you and your wife, Mrs Abe, to our parliament and our nation. You honour all of us with your presence here today. There is so much that our two countries share. Faith in democracy, deep respect for the rule of law, cooperation in peacekeeping missions, global leadership and nuclear non-proliferation. And I acknowledge today the work of our former foreign ministers, Eureka Kawaguchi and Gareth Evans. And we share a steadfast commitment to a stable, prosperous and peaceful Asia-Pacific. For more than a century, Japanese demand for Australian resources has helped build our nation's shared prosperity. Japan is an investor as well as a customer, a true trading partner. For more than 50 years, Japanese investment has driven the development of northern Australia, from the iron ore fields of the Pilbara to the northwest shelf and the Darwin liquid natural gas to the coal mines in our east. And Japan has long been much more to Australia than a leader in technological innovation or a market for our resources. We have traded and shared our values and our ideas too. Australia's arts and our architecture, our food and philosophy, even the way we do business, has been enhanced and enriched by the Japanese. All Australians are grateful for these gifts. We celebrate this diversity. We understand that it helps us gain and grow and learn. For as the Japanese saying goes, Junin to iro, 
10 people, 10 colours. In embracing our differences, we are stronger, and ours is a friendship that shares hardship. When Fukushima was devastated by earthquake and tsunami in 2011, Australian hearts went out to our friends in Japan. Within days, Australian search and rescue personnel, defence operation response officers, three C-17 aircraft were on the scene helping with the clean-up, the search and the rescue effort. They were soon followed by donations and contributions from hundreds of thousands of ordinary Australians. Prime Minister Gillard was the first world leader to visit the region following the disaster and personally convey our condolences for your loss and our admiration for your resilience. In those tough times, Australia was indeed proud to stand by our friend. We gave our help gladly, knowing that Japan would not hesitate to respond with the same speed and generosity. This understanding, this respect and care for each other's welfare lies at the heart of our friendship. A friendship that runs deeper than treaties or trade agreements, summits or state dinners. A friendship built on the open-hearted generosity and the wisdom of our two peoples. It has long been this way. Three years after your grandfather's term as Prime Minister, Yamoto Takata City and the town of Lismore in northern New South Wales became sister cities, the first such partnership between Australia and Japan. Today, 109 communities across our nation and yours share this bond, joined together in the spirit of friendship, of understanding, of learning from one another. People from our two nations building personal connections through the student exchanges, the cultural exchanges, the local government visits. Friendships flourishing through the email and the Skype, the long-planned catch-ups. Be it Bundaberg and Setsu City, in Akawa Town and Ballarat, Geraldton and Kosai City, and of course your ancient capital, Nara, and our capital, Canberra. Every year in the Canberra-Nara Peace Park, a patch of Japanese maples and cherry blossoms amongst the gum trees, Australians and Japanese people gather together for a festival. Surrounded by Japanese sculpture, accompanied by Japanese music, delighting in Japanese food, festival goers light 2,000 candles in celebration of peace and friendship. In that spirit, by those lights, today we say to you that Japan will always have a friend in Australia, a partner in prosperity and a partner in peace. Prime Minister Abe, you are most welcome in Australia and the people of Japan always will be. Yeah. Mr Prime Minister, it gives me great pleasure to invite you to address the House. The Honourable Tony Abbott, MP, Prime Minister of Australia. The Honourable Bronwyn Bishop, MP, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Senator, the Honourable Stephen Perry, President of the Senate. The Honourable Bill Shorten, MP, Leader of the Opposition. Members and Senators, distinguished guests, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place and their elders, past and present. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we Japanese started out again after the Second World War, we thought long and hard over what had happened in the past and came to make a vow for peace with their whole hearts. We Japanese have followed the path until the present day. 
We will never let the horrors of the past centuries' history repeat themselves. This vow that Japan made after the war is still fully alive today. It will never change going forward. There's no question at all about this point. I stand here in the Australian Legislative Chamber to state this vow to you solemnly and proudly. Our fathers and grandfathers lived in a time that saw Kokoda and Sandakan. How many young Australians with bright features to come lost their lives? And for those who made it through the war, how much trauma if they feel even years and years later from these painful memories. I can find absolutely no words to say. I can only stay humble against the evils and horrors of history. May I most humbly speak for Japan and one on on behalf of the Japanese people here in sending my most sincere condolences towards the many souls who lost their lives. There is a story from 1968 that pulls at my heartstrings even now. Australia invited a Japanese woman to come here. Her name was Matsue Matsuo, and she was 83 years old. She accepted Australia's invitation and, in memory of her son, poured Japanese sake into Sydney Bay. Her son was on a small submarine that had sunk in Sydney Bay during an attack on Australia. The people of Australia kept his valor in memory. So many years and brought over the brave soldier's mother from Japan. This is so beautifully open-minded. Hostility to Japan must go. It is better to hope than always to remember. These are the words of Prime Minister Aoji Menjis when he restarted Australia-Japan ties after the war. Again, speaking both for Japan and for the Japanese people, I wish to state my great and wholehearted gratitude for the spirit of tolerance and for the friendship that Australia has shown to Japan. When in Japan, we'll never forget your open-minded spirit nor the past history between us. Prime Minister Menjis was the first to welcome a Japanese Prime Minister to Australia after the war. That was 57 years ago. We signed a commerce treaty between us that propelled us on the road to prosperity, which we still enjoy today. It was my grandfather, Nobusuke Tishi, who signed it. This was the start of Australian coal, iron ore, and natural gas coming into Japan. The second coming of Japan's industry after the war first became 
possible through the help of Australia, indispensable partner. Just as Prime Minister Menjis and my grandfather did, Prime Minister Tony Abbott and I hope to make a truly new base for our relations. This afternoon, Prime Minister Abbott and I will sign the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement. Seven years ago, when our talks on this EPA began, many asked if we would ever see, ever see this day. I think even many members of this honorable body felt the same way. Let us congratulate each other for the many efforts that brought us here today. The next step for us will be that TPP, after that RCEP, and then the EFTA. Let us work forward together, Australia and Japan, with no limit. Yes, we can do it. <laughs> After all, when Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser and Japan's Prime Minister Masayoshi Ohira said that the creation of a Pacific community was a significant long-term objective, we built the cornerstone for APEC. That was no less than 34 years ago. Visions always come from a longitude of 135 degrees east, do they not? <laughs> of course, we are the ones who benefit by making markets that are broad, open, and free. Ladies and gentlemen, opening up Japan's economy and society is one of the major engines for my growth strategy. I'm now working to reform <coughs> systems and norms that have not changed in many decades. Japan will grow by increasing its productivity while keeping good fiscal discipline. To do that, I will become like a drill bit myself, <laughs> breaking through the vested interests and the norms that have deep roots. Reforms are now starting in the fields of agriculture, energy policy, and medicine. For the first time in decades, we also started to reform all norms in our labor relations. Since the beginning, I have stressed that I want to make Japan a place where women shine. I have also said time and again that for non-Japanese with a can-do spirit and ability, Japan and Japanese society must be a beacon of hope. This EPA with Australia will be a great catalyst to spark further changes as we open up Japan's economy. It will also give us a great push forward as we work towards the TPP. Japan and Australia have deepened our economic ties. We will now join up in a scrum, just like in rugby, <laughs> to nurture our regional and the world order and to safeguard peace. Today, I stand in front of you who represent the people 
of Australia and state solemnly that now Japan and Australia will finally use our relationship of trust, which has stood up through the trials of history in our cooperation in the area of security. Australia and Japan have now freed ourselves from, on, from one old layer and are now moving towards a new special relationship. Prime Minister Abbott and I confirmed that already on April 7 in Tokyo. Today, Prime Minister Abbott and I will sign an agreement concerning the transfer of defense equipment and technology that will make the first cut engraving the special relationship in our future history. That is not all. So far as national security goes, Japan has been safe absorbed for a long time. Now, Japan has built a determination as a nation that longs for permanent peace in the world and as a country whose economy is among the biggest. Japan is now determined to do more to enhance peace in the region and peace in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is to put that determination into concrete action that Japan has chosen to strengthen its ties with Australia. Yes, our countries both love peace. We value freedom and democracy, and we hold human rights and the rule of law dear. To die is a die that we bring life to our new special relationship to make its birthday today. I should have brought a huge cake <laughs> to share a piece with every one of you. There are many things Japan and Australia can do together by each of us joining hands with the United States and ally for both our nations. Japan is now working to change its legal basis for security to so that we can act jointly with other countries in as many ways as possible. We want to make Japan a country that will work to build an international order that upholds the rule of law. Our desire is to make Japan a country that is all the more willing to contribute to peace in the region and beyond. It is for this reason that Japan has raised the banner of proactive contribution to peace. Whatever we decide to do, I will tell you that Japan will continue to work together with our neighbor at longitude of 135 degrees east. This is why we have made this special relationship. Let us join together all the more in order to make the vast seas from the Pacific Ocean to the Indian and those skies open and free. In everything we say and do, we must follow the law and never fall back 
onto force or coercion. When, we, when there are disputes, we must always use peaceful means to find solutions. These are natural rules. I believe strongly that when Japan and Australia sharing the common values, join hands, these natural rules will become the norm for the seas of prosperity. That stretch from the Pacific Ocean to the Indian. Today is a day. Our special relationship is born. It is fitting that I conclude my speech with words of gratitude to our dear friends and with an appeal to our young people. I would ask the members of this esteemed body to please look to the gallery where you will see Mr. Robert McNeil of the Fire and Rescue New South Wales. Mr. McNeil, to you I give my deep appreciation. Minami Sanriku in Japan's Miyagi Prefecture was one of the towns that suffered the very worst damage from the tsunami that hit our Tohoku region on March 11, 2011. Mr. McNeil, leading a team of 76 people and two dogs, immediately came to Minami Samrik. There, he worked together with firefighters from Japan. Mr. McNeil said, when the Japanese firefighters were grieving, we were able to share their grief. There were no walls of communication between us. We will keep We will keep his words in our hearts warmly forever. Then Prime Minister Julia Gillard stood motionless with her upper lip tight upon seeing the terrible sight of Minami Sanrik. I would like to express once more my sincere thanks for the leadership that Prime Minister Gillard showed. Furthermore, this is an excellent example, isn't it, showing that Australia-Japan relations go beyond fences between political par parties. Andrew Southcott, Michael Danby, Gary Gray, and of course, Andrew Robb are some of many who have advanced exchanges with Japanese diet members, which will become more and more important. There are many more who have been active in this way. So forgive me for naming only this very few. I wish to thank all those who have made efforts to connect with your fellow lawmakers in Japan. I very much hope you will continue those efforts. Japan and Australia also have ties made through the Japan Exchange and Teaching, or JET, program. The new Colombo plan will certainly give rise to the leaders of the future. Tokyo will, be, will become a place where these young Australians come across 
new chapters in their personal stories. Japan will become a country that will take these young people visiting from Australia as important members of society. Japan and Australia will each work to make our youth exchanges stronger, bigger, and better. This is the era that has now begun. I ask all the honorable members of this body to take back to your home districts the message that Abe said that young people should head to Japan. <laughs> I will do the same for you. I will tell the youth of Japan that they should head to Australia. In 2020, Tokyo will once again host the Olympic and Paralympic Games. As for me, I watched the 1964 Olympics and I saw one of the many who were dazzled by the power of Miss Don Fraser, <laughs> who is in the gallery today. <laughs> Miss Fraser, to me, you are Australia. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming here today. What spirited athletes will you send to Tokyo in six years? We all look forward to seeing that. Miss Fraser Dong, I hope we see you in good shape in Tokyo once more in, in 2020. I hope very much that you bring forth a new dawn to Japan <laughs> and a new dawn to the future of Australia-Japan relations. Thank you very much.
Mr. Prime Minister, on behalf of the House, I thank you for your address and I wish you and Mrs. Abe a successful and enjoyable stay in Australia. Yeah.